Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for a beautiful Sabbath day and the bright sunshine and all the many blessings that you've given us. Please send your Holy Spirit to guide and direct our minds, impress our hearts, and help us to understand what you want us to learn today. In Jesus' name, amen. So one day, my wife came to me with this ex serious expression on her face, and she said, I have a confession to make. She said, I have a skeleton in my closet. And then she proceeded to bring out this guy. <clears throat> but sometimes the skeletons we find in our closets aren't quite this innocent. The phrase skeletons in the closet is a common term for secret things that the owner of the closet doesn't want anyone to find out about. Deep, dark secrets that would be very humiliating or embarrassing for the general public to find out about. Thoughts that a person would just as soon forget and not have to remember. Today, we're going to take a look at a couple of skeletons in someone's closet. Yours. And mine. Luke 8, 17 says, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known or come abroad. To start with, let's read a dream that Sister White had in the year 1867. She says, That night I dreamed that I was in Battle Creek, looking out of the side glass at the door, and saw a company marching up to the house, two and two. They looked stern and determined. I knew them well and turned to open the parlor door to receive them, but thought I would look again. The scene was changed. The company now presented the appearance of a Catholic procession. One bore in his hand a cross, another a reed. As they approached, the one carrying a reed made a circle around the house, saying three times, This house is proscribed. The goods must be confiscated. They have spoken against our holy order. Terror seized me, and I ran through the house out of the north door and found myself in the midst of a company, some of whom I knew, but I dared not speak a word to them for fear of being betrayed. I tried to seek a retired spot where I might weep and pray without meeting eager, inquisitive eyes wherever I turned. I repeated frequently, if I could only understand this, if they will tell me what I have said or what I have done. I wept and prayed much as I saw our goods confiscated. I tried to read sympathy or pity for me in the looks of those around me and marked the countenances of several whom I thought would speak to me and comfort me if they did not fear they would be observed by others. I made one attempt to escape from the crowd, but seeing that I was watched, I concealed my intentions. I commenced weeping aloud and saying, if they would only tell me what I have done or what I have said. My husband, who was sleeping in the bed in the same room, heard me weeping aloud and awoke me. My pillow was wet with tears, and a sad depression of spirits was upon me. Now, this dream of Sister White's is quite interesting in the fact that Ellen White doesn't define what it means. All she does is relate what she saw and then go on describing the rest of her trip and the other things she's doing. Now, there's several layers to this dream. I have learned that God reveals things in multiple layers to cover multiple lessons. For example, one layer shows the Jesuit infiltration of the church. But today, I'm not looking at the physical layer or the typically obvious layers of this dream. I'm going to be looking at a layer of this dream that deals with our characters. Notice that this dream involves Sister Ellen Gould White. Now, as a prophet of God, who would she be representing in these last days? God's people. So in the layer of this dream that I'm going to look at today, she's not representing herself. She is representing you. She's representing me. She's representing all of us. In a sense, she is a woman. So she's representing a church, but not just any church. Her name means light, gold, and white. That's the pure church the remnant who have repented of their former Laodicean condition and who have bought the gold and white raiment 
from the true witness. Now she looks out and she sees a stern and determined company marching up to the house. What sort of stern and determined company marches? An army. So in a spiritual sense, this company that is approaching the house would be representing a type of military or soldier mentality. This means that whether we realize it or not, this dream is dealing with a battle, a fight, a war. They're marching up to the house in groups of two. Now she doesn't tell us how many groups of two there are, almost like it's not important. Although as we go along, you may realize what some of these groups represent. But what seems important in the description and what she seems to put emphasis on is the two. In the Bible, the number two can represent different things, depending on the context. For example, the number two can represent division or separation, as in the second day of creation, when God separated the waters, dividing the waters above from the waters underneath. But we also see another meaning for two. In Genesis 7, 9, it says, There went in two and two to Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. Genesis 7, 15 says the same thing. Two and two of all flesh, in which is the breath of life. Uh, Mark 6, 7, And he called to him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. Luke 10, 1, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So the Bible uses two to represent two different things that work together. Two different animals, male and female, who partner together to produce offspring to repopulate the planet. Two different disciples that partner together to share the gospel. So you can see this use of two and two. So in this dream of Sister White's, she sees a company marching in groups of two. Two different people, two different powers that are partnered together for some purpose. In other words, they must agree with each other on the issue at hand because the Bible specifically tells us, can two walk together except they be agreed? Now she says, I knew them well. What does it mean to know someone well? If I run into John Doe in town and I pick up a conversation with him and talk to him for a few minutes and then I turn around and walk away, can I say I know that person well? To know a person well means that you have an intimate connection with that person. Either a spouse, a parent, a child, a relative, or a close friend. You have been with that person many times. You have learned many things about their characteristics, their habits, their thoughts. You have studied that person for years and are very familiar with what makes that person who they are. So in this dream, these two people, these two powers, that are approaching the house are very familiar to Sister White, to God's people, that's us. So these two powers are very familiar to us. We have been intimately connected with them in the past, so they are well known. Now in this dream, Sister White, representing us, begins to open the parlor door to welcome these two powers that we are intimately connected with. Now this is an interesting detail because according to Webster's Dictionary, the word parlor means a room primarily for conversation, for reception of guests, living room. Figuratively, it means fostering or advocating some doctrine in comfortable seclusion without consequent action or application of affairs. In other words, a parlor is a place to chat or gossip for promoting some doctrine in comfortable seclusion without consequent action or application. Oh, you mean a doctrine that I'm comfortably secluded from. It only applies to that person over there. The word parlor is actually derived from the word parley, which means to speak with another, to confer orally with an enemy as with regards to a truce. So here we are getting ready to parley with or invite into our parlor two well-known people or powers that we have an intimate connection with in the past. We've studied for years. 
But of course, we want to put them comfortably in the parlor. We believe they represent doctrines or teachings that only apply to them over there or them over there. Then Sister White, us, looks again. We take a second look. And lo and behold, the scene has changed. Now notice something. She didn't say that those groups of two people had changed. It was the scene that changed. In other words, the people were the exact same well-known people that she had had an intimate connection with in the past. But what Sister White could see, the details of the picture, were changed. So she's actually seeing something about these two well-known powers that she didn't see before. These previously unknown characteristics reveal to her that these two well-known powers are actually her enemy. And what are these previously hidden characteristics? These two powers, previously well-known, now suddenly look like a Catholic procession. The word Catholic means universal. And the word procession means the act of proceeding or moving forward. So these two previously well-known powers that are marching up to the house suddenly begin revealing previously unknown characteristics that reveal a connection with Catholicism and their plans moving forward, or as far as we're concerned, a universal problem. She saw that one of these powers carried a cross and one carried a reed. Now with the reference to Catholicism, the cross symbol is fairly easy to identify. The cross is often used today to represent Catholicism. But what is this reed symbol? According to Isaiah 36, it says, Lo, thou trusteth in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereupon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all that trust in him. And Ezekiel 29 says, And all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. So Egypt is represented as a staff of reed. A reed is also a very powerful symbol in the Druid pagan world. It symbolizes things it was used for. They made arrows from it, so they held the reed as a symbol for protection and for death. They made paper and writing utensils from it, so they held the reed as a symbol of knowledge and wisdom. Occult doctors used it to administer treatments, so it was associated with the art of healing. The reed was also intimately connected with the devil's celebration of the dead, known as Samhain, or All Saints Day, the day after what they called Holy Evening, or Halloween. In this dream, the one with the reed made a circle around the house and said three times, This house is proscribed. The goods must be confiscated. They have spoken against our holy order. Now this circle of the one carrying the reed, connected with this threefold chant, is a highly interesting connection. In Catholic and Orthodox religions, a priest will walk around the altar while the altar boy stands on one side and holds up a cross. This, they claim, is often done three times in reference to the Trinity. But in reality, it actually comes from an occult ritual in paganism. From the book Hidden Secrets of the Alpha Course, it says, A witchcraft ritual called circumambulation. This long word from the Latin means walking all around. In the mysteries and religions of all ages, there has been the formal procession three times around a sacred place or object and always sunwise, that is, with the devotee's right side on the inner side of the procession. Witches draw circles around things when they're casting spells and curses. It's known as casting a circle. This magic circle, among other things, is to form a boundary that is traced around the working area to set it apart and isolate it from everything else. In her dream, this power with the reed is casting a circle a boundary around their working area, isolating it and pronouncing a spell or curse over this house. The curse that uses the word proscribed. The word proscribed means doomed to destruction, denounced as dangerous or as unworthy of reception, condemned, banished. So here we see these two powers 
are proscribing or putting a curse on the habitation of God's people, the structure. Two powers that are, in a sense, desolating the structure of the church. Now, I want to take a look at prophecy because prophecy is going to tell us what these two powers represent. Daniel 8, starting in verse 11. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the hosts, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under foot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Notice that the transgression of desolation in these verses not only takes away the daily, but also casts down the truth. Interestingly, the daily and the transgression of desolation, in essence, proscribe the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. So what is the daily? Verse 12 gives us a big clue. It says, And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth of the ground, and it practiced and prospered. You can see by these Strong's numbers referenced here, that the daily is one Hebrew word, which is tamid, meaning continual. By reason of transgression is also one Hebrew word, pesha, which means revolt or rebellion. So this verse is talking about a daily continual revolt or rebellion. Kind of like the wickedness that is described in Genesis 6, 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the daily represents paganism. In this prophecy, beginning when paganism desolated God's church, we know this is correct because Sister White tells us in early writings, Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text, and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment hour cry. When union existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily. But in the confusion since 1844, other views have been embraced and darkness and confusion have followed. Now what was the correct view of this daily power that the pioneers had prior to 1844? Pioneers realized the parallels between the transgression of desolation, the man of sin, and the mystery of iniquity. They acknowledged the links between this description and that of the papacy, the little horn, in Daniel 7. In 2 Thessalonians, it shows us that the papacy would take out another power in order for them to rise to power. It says that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit or by word, nor by letter from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all the power and signs and lying wonders. So, to make that a little simpler, here is James White's statement of their belief. James White says, That which withheld the manifestation of the papacy in Paul's day was paganism. These are the two powers which have desolated the people of God, of which the angel speaks in the vision of Daniel 8. So the Bible tells us of two desolating powers that desolate God's church. The first power that desolated the church was paganism, the daily, which was then followed by the second desolating power, papalism, the transgression of desolation. This is nothing new to our understanding. This is the same doctrine that our pioneers held in unison prior to 1844. This doctrine of the two desolating powers 
is well known to us. We know them well. William Miller noticed in the various apocalyptic passages a reoccurring theme of controversy between the people of God and their enemies. In his analysis of the persecuting powers of God's people throughout the ages, he developed the concept of the two abominations, defined as paganism, the first abomination, symbolizing the persecuting force outside the church, and the papacy, the second abomination, representing the persecuting power within the church. It was the motif of the two abominations that characterized most of his following prophetic interpretations. Now, notice that in the book, The Great Controversy, when she talks about 2 Thessalonians, describing these two abominations, she talks about how paganism was just cloaking Christianity in the papacy. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, foretold the great apostasy which would result in the establishment of the papal power. Even at that early date, he saw, creeping into the church, errors that would prepare the way for the development of the papacy. Little by little, at first in stealth and silence, and then more openly, as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of men, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work. Almost imperceptibly, the customs of heathenism found their way into the Christian church. The spirit of compromise and conformity was restrained for a time by the fierce persecutions which the church endured under paganism. But as persecution ceased and Christianity entered the courts and palaces of kings, she laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of pagan priests and rulers. And in the place of the requirements of God, she substituted human theories and traditions. The nominal conversion of Constantine in the early part of the 4th century caused great rejoicing, and the world cloaked with a form of righteousness walked into the church. Now the work of corruption rapidly progressed. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit controlled the church. Her doctrines, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. This compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin, foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. This gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. And even Revelation reveals this problem. Here's an evil woman, a church named Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is found teaching people to follow pagan ideas. It says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. In other words... Paganism only appeared on the outside to be taken away. But in reality, it simply took on a Christian name. A religious cloak was thrown over paganism. It came into the church and took a different form. Pagan Jezebel became the queen of the Israelite nation. Christianity blended with paganism, and this is how paganism and papalism, the two desolating powers, work together to reach a common goal. They are walking together because they are in agreement with each other. So now back to Sister White's dream. The power carrying the cross would obviously represent something that claims to be Christian. So it matches the description of papalism. And the power carrying the reed would then be a representation of paganism. This is obvious when we remember that it is the continual or daily rebellion and that 1 Samuel 15.23 tells us that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Remember, the staff of reed represented Egypt, which was known for paganism. We're told Solomon acted in direct opposition to God's will. He entered into political alliance with pagan kingdoms, especially with Egypt and Phoenicia. So Sister White, representing us today sees these two desolating powers approaching her house, the church structure. 
They are well known, of course, because we all recognize that these two powers are the paganism and the papalism, desolating powers that desolated the church back then. These are the two powers that we have taught in Bible prophecy ever since the time of William Miller. So we're going to let them into the parlor. You know, they apply to someone else back then. We can invite them in and point the finger at someone else because, of course, we're in comfortable seclusion without consequent action or application to affairs. After all, the dates of 508, 538, and 1798 well, they're all long gone in the past, and these powers wouldn't have any bearing on us today. After all, we have the Seventh-day Sabbath. We have the correct state of the dead. We have diet reform. Or let's bring it a little closer to home. We have the charts. We follow William Miller's rules. We have only a we have the only correct view of the three angels' messages. While the rest of the nominal church out there, they're only promoting the milk, we have the real meat of the word. Just look at how the structure is being carried away with the desolating powers of worldly paganism and infiltrated desolations of papalism. They proudly rejected the 2520 while we humbly accepted it. <laughs> Or did we? What if we are comfortably sitting in our parlor, pointing at someone else, confidently patting ourselves on the back, congratulating ourselves in knowing that we have the real truth when we ourselves are in the same condition they are? Perhaps we should take a second look out of this side glass at these two desolating powers. What happened when Sister White took a second look? She was seized with terror. Why? Because she saw something about these two powers that she hadn't seen before. She realized that instead of being well-known acquaintances that she could invite into her parlor and apply to someone else, these two powers were actually her own personal enemy and they were working for the destruction or desolation of her and her structure. What if these two powers are revealing our own personal enemy, the skeletons in our own closets? We would do well to heed 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. What was the main characteristic of paganism? This quotation describing Paul and Nero, or Christianity versus paganism, gives us a few clues. Paul and Nero face to face, the youthful monarch bearing upon his sin-stamped countenance the shameful record of the passions that reigned within. The aged prisoner's calm and benignant face, telling of a heart at peace with God and man. The result of opposite systems of training and education stood that day contrasted. The life of unbounded self-indulgence and the life of utter self-sacrifice. Here were the representatives of two religions, Christianity and paganism. The representatives of two theories of life, the simplicity of self-denying endurance, ready to give up life itself if need be for the good of others, and the luxury of all-absorbing selfishness that counts nothing too valuable to sacrifice for a momentary gratification, the representatives of two spiritual powers, the ambassador of Christ and the slave of Satan. Their relative positions showed to what extent the course of this world was under the rule of the prince of darkness. The wretch whose soul was stained with incest and matricide was robed in purple and seated upon the throne, while the purest and noblest of men stood before the judgment seat, despised, hated, and fettered. So paganism represents self-indulgence, selfishness. But just like the prophecy of the two desolating powers, selfishness gets supposedly taken away to make room for the papalism power. What character trait does papalism represent? 
As I mentioned before, the little horn of Daniel 7.25 is a description of the papacy. It says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. And here is a little more information from the book The Great Controversy. It is one of the leading doctrines of Romanism that the Pope is the visible head of the Universal Church of Christ, invested with supreme authority over bishops and pastors in all parts of the world. More than this, the Pope has arrogated the very titles of deity. He styles himself Lord God the Pope and assumes infallibility and demands that all men pay him homage. Thus, the same claim urged by Satan in the wilderness of temptation is still urged by him through the Church of Rome, and vast numbers are ready to yield him homage. Let none deceive themselves. The papacy that Protestants are now so ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation, when men of God stood up at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity. She possesses the same pride and arrogant assumption that lorded it over kings and princes and claimed the prerogatives of God. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. So papalism would represent arrogance, pride, thinking you know better than God. Pride is committing hateful abominations and acting like you're doing nothing wrong. Proverbs 30.20 says, Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. So we have two desolating powers, pride and selfishness. Pride being simply selfishness masked with a politically correct title. Selfishness carries the reed, paganism, Egypt, the world. Pride claims to have abolished selfishness, and it carries a cross, a symbol for Christianity. Yet it is just the claims of the world with a Christian cover. In other words, pride becomes just a cloak of religion to hide selfishness. She tells us, I saw great iniquity and vileness in the churches, yet their members profess to be Christians. Their profession, their prayers, and their exhortations are an abomination in the sight of God. Said the angel, God will not smell in their assemblies. Selfishness, fraud, and deceit are practiced by them without the reprovings of conscience. And over all these evil traits, they throw the cloak of religion. I was shown the pride of the nominal churches. God is not in their thoughts. Their carnal minds dwell upon themselves. They decorate their poor mortal bodies and then look upon themselves with satisfaction and pleasure. Jesus and the angels look upon them in anger. Said the angel, Their sins and pride have reached unto heaven. Their portion is prepared. Justice and judgment have slumbered long, but will soon awake. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. The fearful threatenings of the third angel are to be realized, and all the wicked are to drink of the wrath of God. An innumerable host of evil angels are spreading over the whole land and crowding the churches. These agents of Satan look upon the religious bodies with exaltation, for the cloak of religion covers the greatest crime and iniquity. Now, suddenly, we should be getting terrified. Because we see that these two desolating powers are not actually just talking about some long-lost power that desolated the church way back then. They are, in reality, our very own enemies. And they're working for our destruction and the destruction of our church structure today. While we claim we don't celebrate paganism or Halloween, yet we secretly uphold and support these skeletons in our own closets while trying to hide them from everyone else. On one occasion, Jesus also warned of these skeletons, these dead men's bones. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. In other words, think about this. Pride and selfishness is nothing but disguised worship of the dead. Now consider when we look at history, 
we find that these two abominations, pride and selfishness, have been a curse to mankind ever since the fall of man. Sister White tells us the first curse was pronounced upon the posterity of Adam and upon the earth because of disobedience. The second curse came upon the ground after Cain slew his brother Abel. The third most dreadful curse from God came upon the earth at the flood. So what was it that caused Eve to fall? Ye shall be as gods. What's that? Selfishness. Ye shall not surely die. Pride. Thinking that she knew better than God what was good for her. What was it that caused Cain to kill Abel? Selfishness. He wanted the blessing that Abel got. Pride. He thought he knew better than God what kind of sacrifice to bring. Same is true at the flood. Selfishness. The thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually. Pride. It had never rained before. They had great weather guessers in those days, and they chose to listen to man's theories instead of the warning from God. We see these two abominations again with Sodom. It says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So Sodom's sin, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. The problem of pride is exposed on the surface here. But what about selfishness? What is bread? Is bread good or bad? The Bible says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So bread is used to represent the word of God. So why would having fullness of bread be considered by God to be iniquity? Spiritual Isaiah says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy rear reward. And James says, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? In other words, the sin wasn't in having the bread. It was in being full. That's gluttony. Like you said, spiritual indigestion. They were not giving away their bread. They were just feeding themselves. That's selfish. So the iniquity with the fullness of bread is selfishness. And they had an abundance of idleness. In other words, they were not working. They were bored. What is that? That's selfishness as well. You can never be idle or bored as long as you are work, working for someone else's good. If you're always doing things for others, you will never run out of something to do. There are so many people to help. Now, bring that message concerning Sodom down to something a little closer to home today. Let's paraphrase that statement concerning Sodom's pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness to step on our own toes. Those who are like Sodom develop pride in the idea that they have bread, the three angels' messages. And they rest content with feeding their own selves instead of sharing their bread, while at the same time they're idle, leaving the work of spreading the gospel undone. That is... Laodicea. That's us. Now in this dream, when Sister White's house is proscribed and her goods get confiscated, what would those goods represent? Here's some inspired commentary on the Laodicean message found in Revelation 3. We find a people that are rich and increased with goods. She says, the message to the Laodicean church is applicable to our condition. 
How plainly is pictured the position of those who think they have all the truth, who take pride in their knowledge of the word of God, while its sanctifying power has not been felt in their lives. The fervor of the love of God is wanting in their hearts, but it is this very fervor of love that makes God's people the light of the world. The true witness says of a cold, lifeless, Christless church, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Mark the following words. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Here is represented a people who pride themselves in their possession of spiritual knowledge and advantages. With Pharisaic pride, they have vaunted themselves. And here's something that Miller had to say about goods. The church in this Laodicean state, like the rich man, will be laying up goods or making great calculations for the outward or worldly concerns of the church for many years to come. Building places for worship, establishing colleges, high schools, academies, theological institutions, to raise up a popular ministry that the world may be pleased, the ministry well supported, and they become the most popular sect of the day, increased with goods. This too is the church. What shall be called the goods of the church? It is those contributions which are deposited for charitable and pious uses, such as Paul informed his brethren to lay by them in store on the first day of the week. These will be increased to a great and astonishing degree in this age of the church. Theological writings and publications, too, are the goods of the church. There will be a great increase of these. Come, see what great things we are doing. Will be the general language of the church, and the names of donors and the sums they contribute will be published throughout the world. So in other words, in a spiritual sense, our goods are the truths that we know. The warning to Laodicea is the warning against that selfish pride that vaunts its goods. A warning against the selfish pride that says, yep, those people over there, that's Laodicea. They claim they're rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing while they're rejecting the truth. I am so much better than them. I have the seventh day Sabbath. I have the correct view of the state of the dead. I have the three angels' messages. I have the correct view of these charts. I follow William Miller's rules. I'm the only one that can explain doctrine correctly. So what's the difference between them over there and us? Nothing. As long as I have that I'm better than them attitude, there's no difference. I'm just as Laodicean as they are. I may truly understand more than they do. I may have more knowledge on prophecy, on Miller's rules, on the charts, on the three angels' messages, but that doesn't make me better than them. It simply makes me more accountable to God. God warns us, unto whomsoever much is given, of him it shall be much required. If I get proud in my knowledge and my understanding, then I have not learned the humility lesson that is the whole point of the 2520, which is breaking the pride of your power. If I haven't learned that, as far as God's concerned, I'm just as Laodicean and stuck up as the nominal people out there. In other words, pride and selfishness will confiscate our goods. And ultimately, we will suffer even the loss of the truths that we know. Now, I'd like for you to take a note of every sin that falls under the heading of selfishness and pride. Here's a list of sins that fall under the general heading of selfishness. And here's a list of sins that flourish where pride reigns. See anything that looks familiar there? We see an example of this type of pride in the story of Peter before his turning point. It says, For each of the classes represented by the Pharisee and the publican, there is a lesson in the history of the apostle Peter. In his early discipleship, Peter thought himself strong. Like the Pharisee in his own estimation, he was not as other men are. 
When Christ, on the eve of his betrayal, forewarned his disciples, all ye shall be offended because of me this night, Peter confidently declared, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Peter did not know his own danger. Self-confidence misled him. He thought himself able to withstand temptation. But in a few short hours the test came, and with cursing and swearing he denied his Lord. When the crowing of the cock reminded him of the words of Christ, surprised and shocked at what he had just done, he turned and looked at his master. At that moment, Christ looked at Peter, and beneath that grieved look, in which compassion and love for him were blended, Peter understood himself. He went out and wept bitterly. That look of Christ broke his heart. Peter had come to the turning point, and bitterly did he repent of his sin. He was like the publican in his contrition and repentance, and like the publican he found mercy. The look of Christ assured him of pardon. Now his self-confidence was gone. Never again were the old boastful assertions repeated. Christ, after his resurrection, thrice tested Peter. Simon, son of Jonas, he said, Lovest thou me more than these? Peter did not now exalt himself above his brethren. He appealed to the one who could read his heart. Lord, he said, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. What's missing? The I. He went from, yet will not I, to thou knowest. Then he received his commission. A work broader and more delicate than had heretofore been his was appointed him. Christ bade him to feed the sheep and the lambs. In thus committing to his stewardship the souls for whom the Savior had laid down his own life, Christ gave to Peter the strongest proof of confidence in his restoration. The once restless, boastful, self-confident disciple had become subdued and contrite. Henceforth, he followed his Lord in self-denial and self-sacrifice. He was a partaker of Christ's sufferings, and when Christ shall sit upon the throne of his glory, Peter will be a partaker in his glory. Now notice this last few sentences. The evil that led to Peter's fall and that shut out the Pharisee from communion with God is proving the ruin of thousands today. There is nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to the human soul as pride and self-sufficiency. Of all sins, it is the most hopeless, the most incurable. Now notice that these two desolating powers of paganism and papalism, of selfishness and pride is the devil's counterfeit of God's way. It is the curse of sin. But Christ came to show us his way. His shed blood is the blessing that is applied in our behalf seven times at the mercy seat in the great antitypical day of atonement. In Leviticus 16 it says, And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, that he die not. And he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. The blood of Jesus is effectual because in Galatians it tells us Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And this miniature of the 2520 displayed on the 1863 chart we see that Christ took the curse of the second death for us. Justice demanded death, and Christ took the penalty for us. Romans 6.23 states, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now the blood of Christ is there, not to excuse sin, but to cleanse his people from it. 1 John says, The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Revelation, it talks about unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And they have washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And they overcome by the blood of the Lamb. So in that miniature on the 1863 chart, which this is the same thing here, we see Christ and his followers, those who, like Peter, have had a turning point and are now Christ-like in character. We see the opposite of the devil's selfishness and pride. The opposite is God's way of selflessness and humility. 
So what do you see here? What's the difference between these two candles? Christ said, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither doth men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So with that in mind, what's the difference between these two candles? This one is useless. The wax will last for decades because it's not being used. This candle here is only taking care of itself. That's selfishness. This one has been illuminated. It is selfless. It is giving itself to be consumed so that others can have the light. It dies in order to give the light. It is willing to take the curse to be in discomfort, inconvenience, or even martyrdom for someone else. John the Baptist gives us a good example of this. John's selfless character is revealed in John 3, where he says, He must increase, but I must decrease. And we know how his life ended. He died a martyr's death. John Wycliffe demonstrates this in the Reformation. It says, Wycliffe fully expected that his life would be the price of his fidelity. The king, the pope, and the bishops were united to accomplish his ruin, and it seemed almost certain that a few months at most would bring him to the stake. But his courage was unshaken. Why do you talk of seeking the crown of martyrdom afar, he said. Preach the gospel of Christ to haughty prelates, and martyrdom will not fail you. What? Should I live and be silent? Never. Let the blow fall. I await its coming. And we see this even today. We've seen people that were willing to die for other people's salvation. My oldest son took the forced chemotherapy and the curse that we knew to be poison, specifically for the protection and hoped salvation of his younger siblings. Another man whom we all know went as a missionary to Africa. I believe God showed him beforehand that he would die over there. And yet he willingly took the curse for the salvation of his African brother and his family. One more selfless example that I know, despite his best efforts to help a church member was falsely accused by his church for several trivial things that they believed they saw him doing that they considered were wrong. For a while, they even took away his keys and his positions. Despite his heartache for being falsely accused, that man lived up to the call, ask not what your church can do for you, but what you can do for your church. When he died recently, he was still selflessly serving the church that had misused and abused him. A disappearing of self is what is required in order for us to lighten the earth with his glory. Hebrews says, But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. In this case, the selfishness and the pride of others was ransacking their goods. Knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise." For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. In other words, this is the comfortable 
2520. That's the easy one. It's easy for this candle to sit here and sit in its parlor and take care of itself. This is the hard 2520. It requires struggle, trial, testing, reproaches, affliction, the spoiling of your goods. As the trials get hot, more of yourself is consumed. The operations of the Holy Spirit will burn away the dross of selfishness and reveal a love which is tried in the fire, a love that maketh rich. He who has these riches is in close sympathy with him who loved us, that he gave his life for our redemption. Now let's look for a moment at what caused this whole sin problem in the first place. What was Satan's problem in heaven? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So what is that? Everything is about what I will do with no thought of the feelings or comforts of others. That is selfishness. Ezekiel says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Hmm. Pride. Pride of appearance. Pride of opinion. Together, this is all self-exaltation. Satan fell from his high position through self-exaltation. He misused the high capabilities which God had so richly endowed him. He fell for the same reason that thousands are falling today, because of an ambition to be first, an unwillingness to be under restraint. The Lord would teach man the lesson that, though united in church capacity, he is not saved until the seal of God is placed upon him and he is made complete in Christ. There is a I in the middle of this, just as there's an I in the middle of pride. It is no longer, what does God want? It is, what do I want? I want to do it my way. I'm going to eat what I want to eat. I'm going to dress the way I want to dress. I won't do it unless I want to do it. I don't care what you want. I'm going to do what I want. Oh, they hurt my feelings, so I don't want to have anything to do with them anymore. I'm in charge of my life, so I'm going to live it the way I want to do it. Oh, so what's in it for me? If you look at this 2520, it parallels both the image and the beast that represent the kingdoms in Daniel. And just like the fierce beasts, Selfishness and pride are always trying to dominate others. Self-exaltation treads all over others because it only thinks of itself. But Christ's kingdom is not represented by a fierce beast. It is represented as a lamb as it had been slain. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And Sister White says, To Daniel was given a vision of fierce beasts representing the powers of the earth, but the ensign of the Messiah's kingdom is a lamb. While earthly kingdoms rule by the ascendancy of physical power, Christ is to banish every carnal weapon, every instrument of coercion. His kingdom was to be established to uplift and ennoble fallen humanity. In the 2520 blessing... Instead of an I, there's a cross, the cross of Christ. Self-sacrifice is the central theme. Like Stephen, whose stoning marks the end of this time period, Christ's followers will also exhibit self-sacrifice. Luke 9.23 says, And he, speaking of Jesus, said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If any man will come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. 
those who would gain the blessing of sanctification must first learn the meaning of self-sacrifice. The cross of Christ is the central pillar on which hangs the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. If any man will come after me, says Christ, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It is the fragrance of our love for our fellow men that reveals our love for God. It is patience and service that brings rest to the soul. It is through humble, diligent, faithful toil that the welfare of Israel is promoted. God upholds and strengthens the one who is willing to follow in Christ's way. What do we see as another name for the self-sacrifice exemplified by Christ on the cross? This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. 1 Corinthians says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemingly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Self-sacrifice is willing to suffer long. Self-sacrifice doesn't vaunt or brag about the truths that we know. Self-sacrifice isn't puffed up. It doesn't seek her own way. It doesn't perform works to be seen of other men. Notice that the underlying characteristic of charity or self-sacrifice is being willing to take the curse for someone else. And we are to be a reflection of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again so that you'll remember it. We are to be a reflection of Jesus Christ. Self-sacrifice is being willing to take the curse to be inconvenienced, made uncomfortable, or even die for the benefit and ultimately the salvation of someone else. Self-sacrifice is the character of true charity. It is the missionary spirit. Self-sacrifice is being willing to walk to town because you loaned your car to the poor widow down the street. Self-sacrifice is giving your last loaf of bread to the hungry homeless kid that just knocked on your door. We all recognize those types of acts as self-sacrifice, but it gets deeper than that. Self-sacrifice is forgiving those who hurt and offend you, even when they don't deserve it. Self-sacrifice is doing things you don't like doing solely for the benefit of others. Self-sacrifice is dropping all your plans and projects and taking time out of your busy schedule to go visit someone who needs a visit. Self-sacrifice is being willing to die in order to save the life of that mean, nasty, ungrateful neighbor. Self-sacrifice is giving when you feel like you don't have anything left to give. This is what God is looking for in his church, the character of self-sacrifice, which includes selfless and humility. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. And James says, but he giveth more grace Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. These two pictures, these two charts, are showing the contrast between God's way and Satan's way. Even back during the Reformation, God was trying to get this message across. About this time there arrived in Prague two strangers from England, men of learning, who had received the light and had come to spread it in this distant land. Beginning with an open attack on the Pope's supremacy, they were soon silenced by the authorities. But being unwilling to relinquish their purpose, they had recourse to other measures. Being artists as well as preachers, they proceeded to exercise their skill. In a place open to the public, they drew two pictures, one representing the entrance of Christ to Jerusalem, 
meek and sitting upon an ass, and followed by his disciples in travel-worn garments and with naked feet. The other picture portrayed a pontifical procession, the Pope arrayed in his rich robes and triple crown, mounted upon a horse magnificently adorned, preceded by trumpeters and followed by cardinals and prelates in dazzling array. Here was a sermon which arrested the attention of all classes. Crowds came to gaze upon the drawings. None could fail to read the moral, and many were deeply impressed by the contrast between the meekness and humility of Christ the Master and the pride and arrogance of the Pope, his professed servant. We see God showing a need for humility and self-sacrifice in many Bible stories. For example, remember Abraham had to experience a lesson in humility and self-sacrifice when he was called to sacrifice his son Isaac. Abraham is a picture of God the Father, giving his son, Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice for sin. So when Abraham, the father, sends a servant to find a spouse for his son, what was the test that would reveal who was the future bride for the son? And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink, and she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Not only did she have to be willing to give the servant a drink, this stranger who she had never met, but she had to, on her own, readily offer to water his camels. Now, if you know anything about camels, you would realize what that was. That was total humble selflessness on the part of Rebecca. Camels drink tons and tons and tons of water. Camels are basically selfish and stubborn, ungrateful. They are known for liking to do things their way. They are usually associated with the rich and increased with goods. In other words, camels are a good representation of Laodicea. To gladly give the servant a drink when he asks for it would be nice and polite. But to volunteer on your own to draw water for a bunch of thirsty, selfish camels is self-sacrifice. It is a thankless job that would take up tons of your time and energy. But that test revealed to the servant that Rebecca had that self-sacrificing character that would make the perfect spouse for the father's son. And that is what God is looking for in his people today. Self-sacrificing character that continues to work for and water selfish, stubborn, self-centered, ungrateful humanity today. It is self-sacrifice, that selfless humility, that is to lighten the earth with his glory. Jeremiah says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. And Sister White says, The Lord calls upon his people to put far from them every stumbling block, be filled with the Holy Spirit, to unite man with God and with his fellow men, to restore to human beings the benevolence lost through sin. This is the glory of the gospel. Let the church arise and shine, for her light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon her. Let the members strive earnestly to obtain the victory over self. So when the fullness of time arrives, two classes develop. Those who follow the devil's anti-Christian way of self-exaltation, selfishness, and pride, they develop the mark of the beasts. Those who follow Christ's Christian way of self-sacrifice, selflessness, and humility are remade in the image of God. This is the yoke of Christ. 
Matthew eleven twenty nine says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The cross of Calvary means everything to perishing souls. Through the suffering and death of the Son of Man, the salvation of man was made possible. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit, God designs that his image shall be restored in humanity, that a new and living principle of life shall be introduced into the minds that have become defiled by sin. The love of God is fully able to restore, rebuild, encourage, and strengthen every believing soul who will accept the truth as it is in Jesus. But in order that this may be accomplished, men must yoke up with Christ. The cross of Christ must be studied. It must rivet the attention and hold the affections. The blood which was there shed for sins will purify and cleanse the mind and heart from every species of selfishness. There's only one way to get rid of those ugly skeletons of selfishness and pride out of our closets. What do I have here? I have here a glass or a cup that's filled to the brim. Can't you see it? What's it filled with? It's filled with the prince of the power of the air. And the only way to get rid of the prince of the power of the air is to force him out by filling your vessel with the water of life. The mystery of how to live a godly life of self-sacrifice, selflessness, and humility is found in Colossians 1, verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Only the presence of Christ can remove those skeletons in your closet. And incidentally, if you take and dump that water out, what automatically fills that vessel? So if you don't stay full of the Holy Spirit, you're automatically full of the devil. Only the presence of Christ can remove those skeletons. Deuteronomy says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Won't you ask Jesus to come into your heart today so that we can take up our cross and follow him? Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for all the many wonderful things that you've been teaching us in your word. Please. Send your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us through the next week and continue to impress these lessons on our hearts. Help us to take them to heart and help us to allow you to fill our vessels so that the skeletons can all be gone and we can be a reflection of you. In Jesus' name, amen.